We love because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. Let's pray. We need it. Oh, Lord. Thank you for being gracious all the time. Your grace never runs out, neither does your mercy. Please, go forth before this message, even now. And we just ask you to, to lead the way, Lord. Give me the words out of your heart. Put them in my mouth and then... Put them in the ears of all of us and then right into our hearts, Lord. We just ask that this message would be yours and not my, my clunky mistakes. So we lift up the morning to you and ask that you would just bless the time as, as we cherish your word and ask you to lead us by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Look back two verses, uh, verses 17 and 18. By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. Uh, John has just finished with the exhortation to strive for obedience, those who abide. When you do that, you don't have to fear punishment. You can have confidence in the day of judgment. If you examine yourself and see the love of God perfected in you, overflowing out of you, working objectively around the people uh, around you, and you see the Lord's Spirit is active. You don't have to be af afraid. You're, you're on the right track. And what he does with this newly established assurance that you can have is he quickly guts it of any merit of our own. That love that you can see at work in your life is giving confidence towards the coming day of judgment, and it's only because of God. Verse 19, we love because he first loved us. And any born-again Christian can read this and say, yes, 100% yes, I agree, because God so clearly made the difference in our life. He was the change that many of men strive for years to, to be loving time and time again, only to come up short. You see this a lot in, in marriages. You know, they'll say, you know, we really tried. We really tried to make it work only for them to fail. People are the constant in the equation, always yielding the same results, anger, malice, hatred, no matter how hard they try. It's all they're equipped to do until a variable gets introduced into the equation until God's love acts upon us, and then change occurs. Now we can love because he first loved us. It's undeniable that God is the agent of love in all of our lives. We love because he first loved us. You can be reading along in your devotional time. Come, you know, you're enjoying the, the fruits of the results of God's love, and you can just testify, yeah, amen, this makes sense to me because I've experienced it firsthand, so we testify of it. It's just right on track. We love because he first loved us. The born-again Christian proves this, the love that we display after regeneration. But if you aren't born again, this is a heavily denied concept, and it's the exact opposite popular view in the world. In the 1700s, the French philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, he made popular the idea that humans were innately good, that they were naturally good, that evil is actually the unnatural behavior of man. It's completely the opposite of everything that the Bible teaches. But for a nation that's 
increasingly becoming more and more godless, denying a loving creator, it doesn't leave us with a whole lot of options. If you take away a loving God and, and your view is survival of the fittest. But that doesn't, that doesn't really play well. When you, know, when you want to deny that God exists, survival of the fittest, and it gets touted until you point out, well, then rape and pillage should be fair game and the shh, don't talk about that part of it. We need love without God. Morality has to factor in and God has to factor out. That's what the world wrestle, wrestles with today. It's their lifelong goal to find self-sufficient happiness. That man is innately good. Man is loving, and that solves that problem. Let's just say that. In theory, it'd be nice, but history proves something differently. But if man is morally good, he just needs freedom. And that's the lie that, that the world's bought into is the removal of authority is all that a good man needs because he's naturally good and loving. Let him thrive. He's a good man. So you end up with a movement towards Marxism, communism, a classless, stateless, moneyless society because everyone will get along and share for the common good. And that's the direction that the United States is moving in. Less law because people are morally good inside, deep down. But no one's shipping communists off to Russia anymore. They're actually the ones in power. And now no one wants to live in Chicago, where the murder rate exceeds you know, Mexico and no travel zones in Africa because they thought they didn't need law. It happens. It happened to Israel time and time again. The current generation enjoys the fruits of law keeping from previous generations, and then they themselves don't know the values of the laws that they're removing. We're certainly not all, all born again who lives in the United States. We're not a loving nation. Man is not loving. So we have loving laws to hold our nation in check. And Israel was no different. Than the rest of humanity. They weren't genetically superior. They're just people. They were, they were unloving, hateful people just like the rest of them. But, but they had God's law. And when they observed it, their nation was blessed. It was that simple. 2 Corinthians 3 says about Israel and the Old Covenant, the law of Moses, but their minds were hardened for until this very day at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is removed in Christ. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. But whenever a person turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Freedom from law comes by God's Spirit through faith in Jesus. That's it. If people don't want to hear about salvation in Christ, leave them with Moses. Leave them with the law. It's what they need. It's not what they want. They want liberty without Jesus. But you end up with Chicago. It gets pretty murdery pretty fast. When we get liberty from the law, or when we get liberty from the law, because we're now loving people, by God's Spirit. It's the only way. Galatians 5, 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Galatians 5, 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. If it wasn't for God's Spirit, without the righteousness of Christ... The law would be necessary to govern us. 1 Timothy 1, 9 through 11. For the laws for the, the profane, those who, who kill fathers and mothers, and immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching, according to the glorious gospel. 
if not for the gospel, if not for the spirit, if not for Jesus, if not for the love of God, we would still be an unloving people. We love because God first loved us. The reason we don't fear coming judgment is because God's love that he loved us with when we didn't love him, when there was nothing lovable about us. Our current now loving condition is due to God and God alone. I'm hammering that because our world won't. They won't give glory to God. They want to reap all the benefits of our world, of our nation that's been built upon Judeo-Christian values. And they've been enjoying it for a long time, and then they want to remove all the value that we have that comes straight from God. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has seen. The love that we have, straight from the Lord, that came down from heaven to this wicked, horrible generation of people, when we had no redeemable quality, there's nothing good about us. That's the love that dwells inside of us. And that's the love that we love our brothers with. Not that there's anything lovable about them, just for the sheer fact that it's God, God's love within us, that there's no partiality for men with God. If he loved this man, he can love that man or any man. If it's his love inside of me, then I can't discriminate. I have to love every man. I was on a prayer walk last week, and, and man, the leaves are coming down. It's crazy how many are in my yard. And I just picked one up, and I said, like, look, this marvelous thing, this, this, this leaf that it had such an, an amazing life that people pay big money for a, a 428 Cobra jet built by Carol Shelby. I had a leaf made from God, so I was just enjoying it for a moment. And, you know, it... It grew and it, it photosynthesized and made food for the tree and then it started to die. But you know, it turned to color and it became beautiful for me to look at. It fell to the ground. It didn't stop there. It kept on decomposing, going into the ground. Nutrients in the ground just kept on. And it's this amazing, marvelous thing. I'm looking around. They're everywhere. They're all across the world. It's happening. God does this year after year. It's just a a dead leaf, but God made it. I think it's the tops. And he made something else. He made all of us. You look around this room, you'll see that he made us not, not as a leaf or the rest of his creation, but he especially made us in his own image. It beats a dead leaf. On that sheer aspect alone, the pinnacle of creation that we are. How could you not love? Just, just being representatives of God. As much as you're in love with God, head over heels for him, just looking around, seeing the, the pinnacle of his creation you want to love. But he went further than that. He made our, his spirit dwell within us. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. It's a brother. This is a, a local congregant at your local fellowship. This isn't just some Joe off the street. This is someone who's indwelt by the Spirit of God. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For no one who does, excuse me, for the one who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. Hebert said, or excuse me, Stott said, it's obviously easier to love and serve a visible man rather than an invisible God. And if we fail at the easier task, it's absurd to claim success in the harder. 
And Hebert said, it's a contrast not merely between the seen and unseen, but between man and like ourselves and God whose nature is very different from us. Someone who's sharing in the inheritance of Christ, born of the Spirit, they love the Lord. They're a true believer. And you hate them? But, but you love God who you can't see? That's ridiculous. That's an oxymoron. It, it's not possible. John says they're, they're a liar. He gives a stern verdict. Look at verse 21. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Beyond it being impossible, God said no. You know, a child says, can I, can I have a lion? It's like, no, it's not possible. But other than the fact that it's not possible, the parent says no. They literally can't, and God commands them to love their brother. You've heard the ancients say, or excuse me, the ancients were told, you shall not murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable in court. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. To be able to say, you fool, you raka, you good for nothing, and sustain a hatred for a brother. This, this is actually proving their condemnation, that the person harboring the malice isn't actually a believer. If they can do this, they're not a believer. Uh, this isn't if, if you get upset for a moment with a brother then you don't love the Father. It's not saying that. It's if you can sustain a hatred. Jesus, after that, said, if you're going to make an offering and you remember your brother has something against you, leave your offering and go reconcile with your brother beforehand. Now, if there's a moment of discord with a brother, just go correct it quickly. That's obedience. But to think that we can continually disobey, choosing not to reconcile with a brother, just to continue to hate a brother continually, that's choosing to live in sin, unrepentant sin. God will not receive an offering from an unrepentant sinner. There's no way to disassociate one's love for God from one's love for God's people. Because God loves his people. He commanded his people to love his people. It's a sin not to love God's people. All right. Let's break ground on chapter 5. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. We're getting qualification of who a brother is. We've gone over Christ before that it means the Messiah, the anointed one, um, the one upon whom the Holy Spirit would rest. It's, it's specific to his deity and his, his mankind and who he is as the God-man. That he's all God. He's all man. He's the Christ that was prophesied in Genesis 3 that who would crush the serpent's head, but the serpent would bruise his heel, that the seed of a woman would. You don't have to be a biologist to know that a, a woman doesn't have seed, so that, that it would be, he would be born of a virgin, which he was. In Matthew 1.18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit, which would make that child Jesus, born of God. And when 
in Genesis 3.15 says that he shall bruise you on the head, speaking of the serpent, Satan, you shall bruise him on the heel. All throughout the Bible, you're giving pictures of what the Christ would look like and that he, he's coming. There's all this imagery. In Judges, there, there's a woman in chapter 4 named Jael, and she drives a tent peg through the enemy's head, Sisera. Zechariah 10.4, speaking of the coming Messiah, says, From them will come the cornerstone, from them the tent peg. Another wicked ruler in, Ju in Judges 9, named Abimelech, he was trying to brutally murder women and children trapped in a tower. In Judges 9.53 says, But a certain woman threw an upper millstone on Abimelech's head, crushing his skull. And of course, you'd be, you'd be hard-pressed not to see the, the foreshadowing we have in King David, who was clearly a type of Christ. And the beheading of Goliath, who, who, who represented Satan, of whom it was said about his armor that it looked like scales, that he looked like a dragon. That's what it literally says, the, the serpent of old. In 1 Samuel 17, 51, Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of his sheath and killed him and cut off his head with it. He used the, the very instrument that Goliath wanted to kill him with. Sounds a lot like Satan getting defeated by the cross. The very instrument that he planned to kill Jesus with was his very undoing. And bruising his heel, Jesus crushed his head. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. The promised Messiah conceived by the Spirit who came and crushed the serpent's head defeated death on the cross, the propitiation of our sins, appeased the wrath of God. Go ahead and flip in, uh, to the left in your Bibles to Colossians chapter 2. Colossians 2, we're going to start in verse 7. If you believe this about Jesus, listen to this declaration of who he is and what he did. Colossians chapter 2, starting in verse 7. For in him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. In him you have been made complete, and he is the head over all rule and authority. And in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, and the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile toward us, he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he had disarmed rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. Yeah, whoever believes that that guy is Jesus, the Christ. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ. You all can turn back. If you believe the accuracy, the, that he is who he says he is, is born of God. D. Edmund Hebert said this. It's long, but it's good. It is the apostolic message that salvation is not merely for an elite few with their high, higher esoteric insights, like private and like, oh, we just know better but it is for all who will personally accept the message of Jesus as the Christ. Everyone who commits himself to this incarnate Savior is born of God, literally out of God has been born. The emphatic out of God stresses the source of the believer's birth. The perfect tense looks back to the time 
when God implanted the new life in the believer and depicts his continuing possession of that new life as a member of God's family. John's statement indicates that orthodox faith and regeneration are united. Everyone who believes is born again, and everyone who is born of God believes on Jesus. End quote. The Apostle John throughout this letter has been diligent not to allow the truth of the identity of Jesus to be alienated or uncoupled from what happens spiritually. Regeneration and faith in Jesus cannot be divorced of one another. John 14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. John 10, 9, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out of pasture. John 3, 5, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Belief that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life, the door by which we are reborn to enter into the kingdom of God, faith that Jesus is the Christ and our spiritual rebirth are as inseparable as the Trinity. They're one and the same. We only receive God's Spirit because Jesus sent Him. We only receive Jesus because He was sent by the Father. Which brings us to the next part of our verse, uh, part of, next part of verse 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and whoever loves the Father. 1 John 4, 9. By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. The Father sent the Son to die for me. Without Him, there is no Christ. Galatians 4, 4 says, Without the Father, Jesus would have never been sent. And Romans 8, 32 says, Without the Father, Jesus would have never been killed. Galatians 1, 1 says, Without the Father, Jesus would have never been raised. 1 Corinthians 15, 17 says, If Christ hasn't been raised, we're still in our sin. Yes, I love the Father. Without the Father, there is no Christ. Yes, we love the Father. The last part of our verse. Loves the child born of him. While we look at this, uh, if men want to get ready for communion. As we have, whoever believes in Christ is born of God. Now, whoever loves the Father loves the child born of him. Whoever believes in Jesus is a child, uh, excuse me, is a child of God. Whoever loves the Father loves the Father's children, i.e. our brothers in Christ. Brothers in Christ love brothers in Christ. Uh, this isn't two parts of an equation or a cause and effect. It's merely a statement of fact. Think of uh, as a law based upon observational science, like, uh, like gravity. Isaac Newton's first law of gravity is the law of inertia, stating that uh, a body at rest will stay at rest or moving at a constant speed will stay at a constant speed unless the force is acted upon it. This computer will stay right here unless I, I swipe it off or an earthquake happens or something, but it'll just stay right there unless it's acted upon. It's just the way that it is. It's a constant fact. Whoever loves the father loves the child born of him. As Isaac Newton recorded uh, what appear to be governing laws of gravity, God gave us governing law of someone who is born again. They love the father and they love the Father's children. How do you know you love the Father's children? Verse 2, By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and observe His commandments. And we are not going to chop this up today, uh, but we're going to use it to springboard into communion because we love the Father. One of His commandments is communion. So, men, go ahead. Go ahead, Jason. Those men who were at our uh, men's retreat learned this one. 
So let's sing it out. Behold this king so innocent, a crown of thorns upon his head. Feel his heart. His heart of grace Behold this man of suffering Who bore the cross and all our shame Breathe again This mystery Nailed to a cross There in our place O Lamb of God You made a way So I could live again Once for all You washed away our sin Streams of mercy and love Flowing free forevermore And your blood ran down Once for all Scars of love can still be seen On your hands and on your feet We feel your heart Your heart of grace the Heaven's gates have opened wide You have raised us up to life Breathe again This mystery Nailed to a cross Nailed to a cross there in our place, O Lamb of God, you made a way. Once for all, you died so I could live again. Once for all, you washed away our sin. Streams of mercy and love flowing free. Forevermore, and your blood ran down once for all. In the shadow of the cross, we see our shame for what it was, and feel your heart. Your heart of grace We see your power breaking through And all that we've become in you We breathe again This mystery Up from the grave Now raised to life O oh, Son of God We lift you high So I could live again Once for all You washed away our sin Streams of mercy and love Flowing free forevermore And your blood ran down Once for all Once for all You died so I could live again. Once for all, you washed away our sin. Streams of mercy and love flowing free forevermore. And your blood ran down once for all. And your blood ran down once for all. Before Jesus ascended, he left us with two ordinances, baptism and communion. That's what we're doing today. He said that this bread is my body, broken for you. And he had a cup of wine, and he said, this is my blood poured out in the new covenant. 
We have crackers and juice. That's fine. It's just symbolic. It's not actual body and, and blood of Christ. Um, but he said, do this in remembrance of me. So let's eat of the bread. Let's drink of the cup in remembrance for the sacrifice. Jesus said, as often as you do this, you proclaim my death till I return. And he's coming back. Amen? All right, we all stand. Let's bow our hearts. Father, thank you for the ordinance of communion. Lord, for purposing it, uh, purposing it in our walk with you to remember the sacrifice that your son made, Lord, so we would be reminded that the debt of our sin is paid in full. We've been atoned for. And we can celebrate that. Hallelujah. We love you. We thank you. And we praise you. And you ask, we ask that you continue to be pleased by the fellowship that will happen with your saints, and that you'd be glorified, Lord, and that you would protect all of us as we go forth this week that we would walk in steps ordained by you in accordance with your will and give glory to you every opportunity we have. We love you. We praise you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.